Greetings YouTube. Today we're looking at the Grosset All Color Guide Arms and Armor. And you can still find these online. I go to Amazon Secondary Market and you can still have these for like $3. Um, in fact, the entire Grosset line is reasonably priced except for the one that deals with the occult. That one is pricey. Apparently they didn't print a lot of them. I wish I had known about this book because it was printed in 71. Uh, same year my wife was born. I would have loved this. So they start out with um, the earliest known weapons. So you have um, stone uh, mace heads, stone uh, um, axes, and the more of a traditional setup. The earliest forms of um, chariots. Some of these have actually, some of these very similar to this have been found in tombs. Then we have the classical Greek warrior, the large shield. Um, with his spear, which is not as long as it would have been in real life, that's more of a, this is more of a javelin. Then we have uh, large uh, bronze swords. A lot of people don't think of bronze swords as being long bladed and designed for piercing, but there were examples of like that in the real world. Then we have some examples of early helmets. In the lake. A later Greek period, and again, that's more of a javelin. The spears would have, the sarasus would have been very long. Some of them could reach 18 feet in length. Um, the Etruscans, and then we have uh, early Roman. Um, then we have the classic pilum, Roman shield, and the gladius. The Gauls, the gladiators, and a classic Celtic shield. We have some Huns, some Goths, Saxons and Vikings, classic Viking axe, classic Viking sword and shield. Here we have a long, Viking longship. Here we have more of the classic Viking accoutrements. And this would be, um, uh, which appears to be, both these appear to be actually found items. Um, this is a scram sax and this is a single-edged Viking sword. The Vikings did in fact use single-edged um, uh, swords in some cases. Then we get into the post-Viking era, um, or, or at the end of the Viking era, when you get into the, the Normans. The crack of chivalres, uh, cheval, chevalers, sorry. Uh, this was one of the most famous of all the castles ever produced. It was just, it was considered to be the height of, of, of technical uh, sophistication at that time. And again, we have so many swords. As I've often said, if you ask 12 weapon experts to identify a single sword, you will get 13 answers. Um, some more of the classic kite shield from the Budog tapestry. I have a copy of that, not the copy of the tapestry, but I have a copy of um, photographs that cover the entire tapestry. I should break that out someday and do a video on it. I just don't know where I put the thing. Um, then we have some of the uh, helmets. And again, more displays. And this is a, a Falchon, which was uh, actually used quite a bit in, uh, in, uh, in Britain. I always like that helm. Can we have some early, some early knights before they started wearing lots and lots of uh, armor? Geometric mace. These are deadly. Because the beauty of this thing is, if you hit someone with one of these points or a, or a warhammer in that same regard, when you dent the armor, the armor stays dented. And here we have a heavy crossbow with a kranken. Obviously, you're not going to be making many shots with this, but if you place it well, a, a crossbow this powerful can punch through a great deal of armor. Um, but that's one of the reasons you have these ridges and these slopes to help deflect things like sword blows and um, crossbow and arrows coming, crossbow bolts and arrows coming in. The 15th century. So you're setting it into the really sophisticated high end stuff. But a lot of people think of, of, of knights in shining armor. This is what they're thinking of. And we have a practiced uh, target. So the idea being is that you would strike this and get out of the way before this smacks you in the back of the skull. And this, these are designed purely for, for tournaments. These are not used for combat in the least um, because they're, they're completely specialized. 
And we have uh, chain barding, plate barding, and this kind of large saddle, which would very much lock the knight in place, coming over his, the back of his thigh and then coming over the, up, up to the front of his torso, very much holding him in place, allowing him to have more freedom of movement with his arms because he's less concerned with falling out of his saddle. And some ornament, or, ornate stirrups. I saw a wooden stirrup recently at an antique shop. It's quite interesting. Then we have some um, some daggers, which I've always loved daggers, because like a classic dagger like this, the, the proportions of, of, of just, there's just something about it I find very visually appealing. Pole arms, so many pole arms. I do love me some pole arms. And then we have two maces up here. And we have uh, three different war hammers. Uh, two of them with very long um, protective um, extensions here to keep the shaft from breaking or being hit by the enemy. And then we get into some of the really ornate, strange, weird things that were near the end. Ornate helmets like this. I mean, the, the, the Japanese and the Chinese did very similar things with their helmets, putting you know demonic faces on them to psych out their opponents. I mean, I got a feeling that armor like this probably never saw a lot of combat. And we get some more of the slightly stranger um, types of, uh, like, sword. Like, this is, that's not a sword that was used in an everyday uh, uh, combat. I believe this might have been strictly used for hunting. I know these are both hunting. This one, I'm not positive. This may be a hunting, because this section is not sharp, and that is... Then we have a heavy crossbow with another form of cranking. Um, this one, you would put it on there and you'd wind it this way. So pull, pull, the, pull it back. Um, and I think that was used strictly for hunting. Uh, this, this is the five finger sword because that's how wide it was. That's another, these, are, these, these two are other hunting uh, swords. People don't think of swords as, as hunting devices, but they were used as hunting weapons at times. Then we get into the early period of, of gunpowder, which began to end the end the era of the uh, of the knight. And you can see the armor starting to change. There is like essentially no leg armor at this point. Look at that. Then just fascinating. I've seen these kind of things in person, man. They're just unbelievably beautiful. And again, now we're getting into the 17th century and you're really seeing a reduction. This is purely protecting the, the vitals in here. Even less less just the head and the, and the chest. Very minimal facial protection. I think this one, just this is a Japanese helmet. I think it's just, just got the single piece there. Though there may have been a mask worn under that one. Then we start getting into the later period. But still, some very ordinate types of weapons. These are probably used by ceremonial guards as opposed to, you know, day-to-day -day combat. Then we get into the age of fencing. Got some daggers, some with very ornate um, guards. And then we have here, all, all of these designed strictly as, as uh, off-handed weapons. This designed to catch your enemy's blade, and the same with this. And I believe this may have been a measuring tool, which is why the plug, the, the lines are on there. Hunting swords and hangers. So again, you're seeing swords being used in a, in a, in a, in a non-combat, but still a very dangerous pursuit. Then we start getting into like these two. Those are bayonets. You would be plugged them into the end of a of a of a barrel. It wasn't until later that people realized if you put the bayonet locked it outside the barrel, you could fire it with the bayonet in place and then use the bayonet. Um, I'm getting to like the 18th century. This is a good example of a, of a hunting set designed strictly for you know, in the field, not for combat, but it's a it's a camp set of, of, of knives and, and utensils. And again, we're getting into the ceremonial. Here's the ceremonial gorget that I mentioned. It's all the, it's, it's the vestigial remains of armor. And then we start getting into true bayonets, as we think of bayonets in the 20th century. And we have the ceremonial uniforms worn by militaries. And we have some Scottish weapons! Woohoo! I can't do a Scottish. And we have 20th century helmets and uh, weapons. Like here, we have a folding knife. 
we get into the war, Second World War, and then we start getting into uh, these are uh, a selection of military swords from 1600. And again, lots of these would have been worn just as ceremonial items. And then we start getting into non-European um, weapons. These are like that's these are African. There, um, that's the Middle East. These are African. Uh, North American traditional styles, Japanese, Indian, more Indian. There's some elephant armor, but just a fascinating book, and I highly recommend this to anyone that's into this.